Joining me is Christopher Smith and Roger Landis, Director and Associate Director of the Vernacular Music Center. Thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. Glad Thanks. to be here. And we're talking about a conference that starts tomorrow, the, Amer uh, the Electric Guitar in American Culture. First off, what is that idea? Where does the guitar, the electric guitar sit in American culture? Well, it straddles most uh, every genre of 20th century and 21st century music. It is the most popular musical instrument in the history of the world. Um, several millions are made every, and sold every year. Is that, what, is that the idea that made you want to, to do this, to, to kick this off here at Texas Tech? Actually, there's the, the field of electric guitar studies as an academic field is relatively new and still relatively small. And there's only been a couple of academic conferences like this, one three years ago in Ohio and then the following summer in Paris. And there's no, there's no uh, ongoing conference. And so we decided Texas Tech, Lubbock, Buddy Holly's hometown, this is a natural place to have a, to have a guitar conference. So we decided we'd try it this year and see, and if it goes well, we might try to repeat it on an ongoing basis. It really, really works, right? Mm -hmm. You've got the Buddy Holly connection. There's some great musicians that have come out of here, mm -hmm. um, including the Flatlanders, and on and on and on. Uh, one thing that sort of popped into my head when thinking about this and, and interviewing you is the sort of iconic image or moment or story that sticks in my head about the electric guitar, and I thought I'd ask you guys the same. What is that moment for you, Chris? Well, as we were saying, this is the kind of argument about which guitarists will go on at great length. But, uh, and I would be hard pressed to pick a single one, but if I had to pick the one that pops into my head when you said that, uh, it's, uh, it's actually Jimi Hendrix on uh, New Year's Eve of 1969. Yeah on stage at the Fillmore East with the group he called Band of Gypsies playing a song called Machine Gun. Mm. And for me, that is a moment that just crystallizes uh, uh, a watershed in not just in the history of the guitar, but in how musicians thought about their role in a civil society. It's awesome. Roger, what's yours? Well, same exact instrument, another Fender cast, uh, Stratocaster player, but a few years earlier. April of 1962, Dick Dale releases his version of the classic Greek song, Miserlou, which later was used in 1994 as the main title theme for Pulp Fiction, which reignited his career and, and, and kicked off a third wave of surf music revival. What Dick Dale did with that one performance on that one record was create a genre. And what's amazing about just that conversation right there is you remember the day, yep. you remember the year, yep. and it's, there's so many little moments that really stick out to you that have lasted all these years that mm -hmm. you've thought about, and, and it's just incredible to me. And I mean, that, that shows sort of the relevance and maybe the need of a conference like yeah. this to talk about these things yeah. and where they fit into our culture um, in a scholarly way, an academic way, but then also just in the fun way, you know, that, that we think of them in that as memories, um, as topics of discussion. I remember my brother taught himself how to play the electric guitar. I remember sitting outside his room for hours and just listening to him tool away and play all kinds of, of amazing things. I mean, I imagine there's a lot of that type of thought that's gone into this conference as well. Yes. Those ideas. Yes. And it's interesting that the, it's so important to American culture and in fact global culture. And it's so popular, sells well, even though we occasionally see these um, sky is falling <laughs> articles about the end of the electric guitar. It's mainly those are about business and not about culture. Um, it's interesting that given its importance that there hasn't been you know, a, a, an established or longstanding critical scholarly tradition around it. It's starting to happen now and we decided to do our bit to try and help that out. One of the nice things about that is that because of Roger's prior experience at these other guitar conferences um, and as part of this field of guitar studies is that he and as a result of Vernacular Music Center are very plugged in with circles of people who are doing scholarship, like our keynote speaker, the great Steve Waxman. Um, Roger, in another way, is plugged in with the world of, of electric surf guitarists, so we have a phenomenal 
a uh, surf guitarist named Dave Ronsky coming, who's actually going to play, I think for the first time in his career with an orchestra. Yeah. Oh, wow. We also have the great good fortune to have on our School of Music faculty uh, a guitarist and composer named DJ Spar, who is both going to perform in the Saturday Night Concert and has also written a concerto for orchestra and jazz guitar called Katrina. Um, and it was premiered this past weekend and it's going to be reprised um, Saturday night with um, the soloist for whom it was written, a, a wonderful New Orleans jazz guitarist named Ted Ludwig. So this is a place in which the Vernacular Music Center wants to bring together the academic and the performative and the, the written and the sounding and the campus community and the international community and the local community. We have um, a slate of events which we think will be really accessible and engaging for lots of different people the scholars, and then much wider circles beyond that. And it starts tomorrow, October yeah, 12th. And, mm -hmm. and what are some of the, so those are some of the music elements. Mm -hmm. What are some of the scholarly elements or, or the discussions that are going to be had? Sure. Well, I can, I can speak to that. The, uh, we have, it's, it's a conference, which means that we have academic papers and we had scholars from across the country who submitted proposals for presentations on everything from gear to uh, the semiotics of the guitar to gender and guitar, very wide range of approaches um, from these scholars. We had a steering committee, wonderful steering committee, who really worked hard to kind of curate a set of panels that happened Friday and Saturday, tomorrow and Saturday, uh, in the Senate room in the Student Union Building on the campus. And then uh, Saturday night, we have this uh, set of premieres, Dave Ronsky, Ted Ludwig, DJ Spar, all playing with our University Symphony Orchestra in Hamley Hall. Tomorrow night, we have a really cool thing that's happening on the plaza down at the, uh, the Underwood Center downtown. We have a, um, a guitar slingers concert with a house rhythm section and nine or ten. Ten. Ten ah. regional guitarists. Yeah. Very nice. Because so after all, this is a, uh, it's a place that a lot of great guitar players have come from and are still here. And uh, we're really fortunate that Scott Ferris, who runs Amusement Park Studios, a wonderful man himself and a great guitar player, yeah. has taken it on to say, I'll get you the players and I'll, uh, I will MC the show. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. That'll be fun. We, we know Scott here at Tech Tech Public Media, a big supporter of the stations yeah. and just a great musician and guy. And both yeah. of those shows, both tomorrow night, Friday and Saturday, are free. That is yeah. very, very excellent. I was yeah. just... As you said that, I was thinking of Bill and Ted, and I almost did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I imagine that on the Lu I imagine that on the Luca Plaza tomorrow night there'll be a lot of air guitar. There will be played. some air guitar, and maybe even in Hemley Recital Hall on Saturday. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Are there, are there some other Lubbock players, or does it look a little more regional after Scott? Uh, we have ten players slated okay. in a three-hour concert on uh, tomorrow night. Yeah, that yeah. is wonderful. Yeah, yeah. How great is that? We going couldn't get everybody be? because some of them were booked, but we got a full slate and we're really lucky to have them and we felt it was important if we're going to try and bring a, a national international conference on the guitar here to show those people who come here for that conference what's mm. going on in here in, uh, in Lubbock and why the guitar is so important to us regionally. Yeah, we should mention that we've had great support both from offices across the campus, the office of the provost, uh, the office of the vice president for research, uh, media and communications, our School of Music, our Talkington College of Vision Performing Arts. We've also had great support from the LUCA and also from the Buddy Holly oh, yeah. Center. So it's been a great thing with the campus sponsors and organizations and the community sponsors and organizations. And I know you said it earlier, but it sounds like just from what you were saying, you know, having people have the optics of seeing how mm -hmm. all these different components are coming together, but it really sounds like something that you're trying to build a foundation where this can continue yeah. on and on. Is that, yeah. is that the hope to kind of come back and do this every year, every other year? We, we're really encouraged by the response we've gotten and also the support here locally. I, so far, we don't know any reason why it couldn't happen, yeah. but we need to do it once. Sure. You know, we need people to come out and support it. And, and uh, the more successful it is uh, this weekend, the more likely it'll be that it will come back in a year or two, however frequently we decide to repeat it. So. Roger, you, you mentioned something interesting that I want to kind of dive into just a little bit is, is you do read sometimes about big guitar manufacturers going under, uh -huh. shuttering their doors. You, you re the Washington Post had you know, a big story, I think, last year mm -hmm. talking about the death of the electric yeah. guitar. Yeah. And you said something really fascinating, because me, as someone who doesn't dive into this as much, I kind of believe those, and I believe those narratives. And you mentioned something that maybe business 
but not culture. Well, it's just like, you know, all these articles about downloading and what that's done to the recording industry, but they never say this has impacted the recording industry. They talk about it as if it has happened to music. And I like to draw a distinction between what's happening with musical culture, what people care about and what they're doing, and somebody's business model. Because usually there's an angle behind those national um, uh, articles that's being driven by economics, being driven by, you know, you, you mentioned guitar companies going under the big reorganization at Gibson that's, that's underway right now. Mm -hmm. um, Fender uh, is one of the co companies that's stayed really light on its feet and been really creative and forward-seeking and been able to avoid some of the mistakes that uh, that the, that business model uh, might have uh, fallen prey to. And it's something that I think has always sort of represented. Um, you know, we we talk about Buddy Holly, you know, an icon uh, yeah. of American music, and it's always sort of has a rebellious nature to it. Where does yeah. that come from? Because there's there's tons of great instruments that you can choose from but the, the electric guitar especially even separate from the acoustic guitar mm -hmm. has this idea of rebellion tied to it where does that come from i uh, popular culture is a complicated thing and there are layers and layers of meaning that happen in north america that happen around the world layers and layers of associations about all kinds of things all kinds of cultural objects to me the 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 great small d democratic leveler of the electric guitar is that it's portable and adaptable. It can go almost anywhere and almost everywhere that it has gone, local people around the world in many different musical traditions have found a way to take this instrument that comes from a North American context, from the bench of the great Leo Fender, and figure out some way to play that instrument in their own music which makes it a powerful and contemporary expression of who they are. So it's not just an expression of this is the guitar, this is the electric guitar, but it's this, this, this is these people here or here or here or here, everywhere in the world saying this can be ours and it can speak of us. And the accessibility, the adaptability, the ubiquity of the guitar I think is a great small d democratic uh, expression that art the creation of art is something that should be available to everyone and you both work with young people here young musicians do you see that my son is 17 and he he's never wanted to pick up a guitar which of course my one situation and one example does not speak for the larger uh, community or world is it something that is still as popular with the youth do you feel like people still gradu uh, uh, gravitate to wanting to, the first instrument they pick up is the electric guitar? It's interesting, Fender did a, uh, an exhaustive study a couple of years ago, which they then published. Um, and they found that the stability in the market has to do with fewer guitars buying more guitars. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> the younger a person is, the, le the less likely they are to take up the instrument. Mm. If they do take it up, they play it for less than a year and, and then move on. And so there's a, a, a huge used market. But it has to, we joke about uh, guitar acquisition syndrome. <laughs> you know, uh, what's the right number of guitars to, to own? N plus one? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and a lot of us are like that. And a lot of us our age and, and you know, younger and older um, have been doing that for decades. So that's probably where the stability of the market is. It's not from growth uh, right now, in the last few years, of young people picking it up. At the same time, I would say that it is the accessibility of a tool, a simple tool, a tool that is relatively economical, um, very portable, relatively resilient and durable. It's the accessibility of a tool for making music, whether it's an 808 drum machine or a Fender Stratocaster or a button accordion or a boom box, um, though the accessibility of those tools is incredibly important because from where we sit as director and associate director of the Vernacular Music Center, the opportunity for individual humans of any age in any location of whatever economic strata 
the opportunity for them to be able to make art for themselves and their community is incredibly important and something about which the advocacy on behalf of which we feel very strongly. And you definitely see that in, in the software realm. Now it is so easy. I mean, Apple computers, every laptop and probably their desktops too, come with uh, GarageBand. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's taking it into to a, to a more digital form, but a more accessible? I would say that, that accessibility is the great benchmark, whether it's Loops or GarageBand or a Fender Strat or the Dan Electro that I bought at a guitar sale when I was 11 <laughs> years old. Uh, just to have your hands on the tool that helps you as a young person, as an old person, as a professional, as an avocational musician, make something that didn't exist before, to, to, to bring into the world something which you find beautiful, a sound or an object or a recording or a download. That's incredibly empowering. Mm -hmm. And in a world in which more and more we feel we're not in control of what happens to us, to our society, around us, of the data that comes in at us, to be able to, to have that empowerment, that's an incredibly, I think it's incredibly fundamental. I think it's kind of a basic human need and right. Absolutely, and, and you know, thinking to all of, uh, all of these different ideas and, and sort of going just a little bit back to the idea of, of where it sits in American culture. I think about, so for me, like Kurt Cobain destroying a stage with a guitar really stands out. And I don't, and I, once again, you know, as I get older, I might just be missing this stuff, but I can't think of those types of iconic moments that necessarily happen anymore that stand out with the electric guitar? Am I just, am I just missing it? I think there's somebody at home sitting on the edge of her bed with a, with a cheap knockoff guitar that she just got her hands on and playing those first chords on that instrument and realizing that her life just got a lot bigger. Mm. That's what I believe. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, those, those memories stand out when we're in that moment, when we are that age, when I'm listening to my brother play his guitar for the first time and I'm just a kid on the floor. And so when I see those moments happen, they, they hit me differently than maybe they do in today's mass media culture. One thing I'd like to point out is a Texas sure. native from the Dallas area, Annie Clark. Oh, I saw Saint, I saw Saint Saint, Vincent yeah, is, I saw her at one of her shows. I went to Dallas and saw her show. Yeah. And you're right. I, how I take often that back. do yeah. how often do we get somebody that redefines the role of the guitar sure. in their own idiom? Yeah. Uh, and she has done that. And in, in addition to being a great singer and songwriter, she's found a different way to play the guitar, different sounds, different touch. Um, and I'm sure she is inspiring uh, young people. I know, I, I feel bad she now. That I, I basically <laughs> have to take back what I said because I was at her show in, in yeah. Dallas and it was just her, just her on the stage yeah. with her guitar and I sat there entranced for the entire runtime. Yeah. And so there are still those iconic moments that happen. Yeah. I think maybe they're fewer and, and further between now simply because fewer people are picking it up. Sure. Also, there's this, you know, this, this really important confluence between uh, what was happening in popular culture and in the society at large and with technology, with first with, with radio and, and, and commercial recording technology, then the electrification of the guitar, mm. the world wars, shifting demographics, all of this came together to, to help create what we call, now call rock and roll. And the electric guitar was an important part of that. Now if the electric guitar had been established in the 60s rather than the 30s, if there hadn't been a Charlie Christian and a, and a, um, uh, and a uh, T-Bone Walker. Walker and a B.B. King, th then maybe there wouldn't have been you know, Scotty Moore and, and uh, uh, everyone else who followed you know, in the 60s. So it's important that these things lined up in the way that they did. And plus they mushroomed in a particular way because of a set of conditions. And those, condi could, uh, those conditions don't exist now. Other conditions mm, do. Yeah. And we don't know what, what those conditions mm -hmm. are gonna push yeah. culturally. We don't know it yet. Yeah, so. that is wonderful. I mean, some of the people you mentioned, there's, their guitars are so famous that we know their names. I mean, yeah. I think of B.B. King's Lucille. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, what are what are some of your so we talked about maybe the the sort of iconic moment? What are some personal moments for you and the electrical hmm. guitar hmm. that you can think of? Um, for me, I would say playing rhythm guitar for about 
40 seconds for Jaco Pastorius in about 1983. I happened to be on the stage in a club called Jack's in Cambridge, Massachusetts um, with, a, with a mentor of mine named uh, Larry Guitar Bader, the only Jewish guitar player, Jewish blues guitar player from Kansas City, he calls himself. Um, and he had a band, he was playing with a band called the James Montgomery Band and I was sitting in in Jaco Pastorius. At that time, the absolute most influential bass guitarist in the world came in. And he came in and he laid down about 40 seconds of the absolutely most hellacious shuffle I have ever even heard, much less had to lasso. And uh, that's one of those moments when you're glad to be there, you're stone terrified, and the adrenaline is pumping so hard that you almost don't even think anymore. And that can be that can be a really kind of transcendent moment. So I would say um, 40 seconds of playing with Jaco Pastorius was probably right up there for me. Yeah. For me, when I was a kid, I got my first electric guitar. My parents could afford the guitar, barely. They couldn't afford an amp. And so my dad and I built, my, built an amp wow. for myself out of, we bought a bunch of those portable record players that had the two, the two uh, um, hinged front uh, speakers, mm -hmm. and we took them all apart and figured out how to wire it all together and get a get a signal out of the guitar. Um, that, and then learning how to play surf music and mm. pick tunes that will make people laugh out loud. That was uh, that, that was enjoyable. <laughs> you go in, you go into the Batman theme. You know, <laughs> people will laugh. Uh, you know. Which reminds <laughs> me, we have a wonderful program coming up uh, here on Saturday night in Hemley Hall. Oh. We have, uh, and the, there's a connection here. Okay. Um, DJ Spice Katrina, the great jazz guitarist Ted Ludwig, DJ is going to play Steve Reich's uh, solo piece, Electric Counterpoint. Dave Vronsky is going to play um, a medley of tunes that might very well make people laugh out loud. Yeah. And then we have a secret surprise, shh, don't tell anyone, encore. Yeah. Ah. So if you're coming to the show on Saturday night, stick around for yeah. the one that's not in the program. We have <laughs> an encore coming. Excellent. All of that sounds sounds so great. Where can people go to find more information about this? I mean, they're gonna people who are watching are gonna want to do this pretty soon because tomorrow's yes. when it all gets started. Well, the easy thing is go to Facebook and, okay. and just search for the American guitar or the electric guitar in American culture. There will be links there. We also have a website up. If you Google the the conference, that will come up. Uh, we have a Twitter feed which will be kicking in high gear next next week, uh, building up to the to um, to it and. Uh, um, that's probably the easiest way, yeah. Is there, you, you, we've talked about all, all the shows sound fantastic, all the players sound good, we've gone over some of, is there something just like individually you would say, this is my pick for the thing you should see, or, or maybe this is something that will surprise you, or yeah. this, yeah, okay. I, I've, I got like that, I've got that ladder, you know, we, we, we have this wonderful working relationship with Scott Ferris, mm -hmm. and Scott is an absolute mensch, gets great sound, great guitarist, been very generous with his time and expertise. Well, Scott is curating a vintage amp room. You know how sometimes you go into a cigar store and you have the really nice <laughs> uh, humidor room? Well, Scott, in the, in the student union at, at, the, at the sub, at, uh, oh, okay. he's, curating, he's, he's bringing in a bunch of amps from his own collection yes. so that guitarists can come in and kind of experience this yeah. curated amp collection. It's not a humidor, it's an ampador. <laughs> For for me, it's having. I, I think I think both of the shows are going to be fantastic. But for me personally, one of my heroes is Dave Bronski, mm. and he does things with the surf guitar genre that you wouldn't think a person could do. Um, influenced by jazz, influenced by Chet Atkins, he's got big ears and really amazing hands. And the sound that he can make live with electric guitar is an absolutely beautiful, complex sound and I can't wait for the room full of people in Henley to hear his sound live. That's going to be awesome. It's, it's a pretty complex signal chain. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm really looking forward to it. We have about a minute left so mm -hmm. if, if you want to thank some sponsors you can do sure. that. If the mm -hmm. Vernacular Music Center has some other upcoming things okay. people should look for. Sure. The um, office of the, uh, on the campus, the office of the provost, the Department of Media and Communications, the office of the vice president for research, the Talkington College of Visual Performing Arts, Director Kim Walker of the School of Music, um, the uh, Underwood Arts Center off campus, the Buddy Holly Center. Mm -hmm. Coming up, I will tell you that at the end of October, just in anticipation of, thanks, mm -hmm. of uh, 
Halloween, we are doing a live improvised orchestral score to the 1922 vampire silent classic Nosferatu at the historic Wallace Theater in Leveland, Texas. Two nights, Friday and Saturday, the last of the month, yeah. with a live improvised score. The 26th and 27th. Yeah. One of the most frightening films, even to this day, mm -hmm. classic, one of the best films ever made, in my opinion. I'm a movie guy. I mm -hmm. highly suggest people go check that out, especially with live orchestration. That You can't get much better than that. Gentlemen, thank you so thank much you, for being here. Always a pleasure. For more from The Sit Down, go to kttz.org.